Big applause for Catalina and Thomas. Did you recognize she knew the precise number? 46, Thomas. <laughs> As I said, always a strong woman in the back. That's, <laughs> that's important. Yeah, As you all know, uh, forests uh, worldwide are endangered through wildfires, climate change, and of course, deforestation. That's why um, reforestation is such a big issue these days. And that's, of course, uh, the topic of our first panel. This morning, it's, it's who owns the forest, the vision and reality of reforestation. Um, but first, we will start uh, as, uh, two times this uh, day uh, with a panel lecture. Hopefully, it gives us a broad overview of the challenges of sustainable forestry and afforestation from, from the perspective of the science, but here in Austria. Uh, we uh, know we are, want to welcome now on stage the scientist and managing director of the Federal Research Center for Forests here in Austria. You all know him quite well from the lively discussion yesterday. Please, ladies and gentlemen, give a warm welcome to Peter Meyer. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Andreas, and thank you for making the sunshine as a weatherman. So you really took on your response. I packed my summer suit, so I'm very happy that the sun is shining today. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here with you and uh, have the opportunity to uh, give a little kickstart on um, and framing of all the, uh, the things we're discussing here at the, the TRICO event. Um, you, knew, you know, communication research tells you that there's, we as uh, consumers of information, our attention span is six minutes. But I have to tell you that, uh, so, so when I start now, you're very interested, but it's going down from there. So <laughs> all of us who have done that know it's difficult to keep up with the, with, with, with the tension of listening to a speaker. So I put uh, my presentation into three parts, six minutes each. So I hope that every time when I finish one chapter, it's again six minutes that you pay attention to what I'm saying. So let's try that. I, I put a very ambitious title, Society, Forests and the Future. So that's kind of everything. But um, it's really something where I would like to um, have a bigger picture on uh, what we are talking about and then have a, a few details also about climate change. I start off with global megatrends. We as citizens, is that how we want to will live in the future? Maybe it is. It combines many aspects here. It's forests, it's it's solar energy, it's uh, alternative ways of housing. To just uh, start your thinking of how will we de de develop in our society and how will we um, live in the future. One of the very important megatrends, and you've read that of course in newspapers or heard about it, is the development of the world's population. And I'm always... Um, very s much um, astonished when you see these figures and development, not only the overall development that we will turn to 11 billion people, but also the proportions of the continents and people living there. And the most significant change is Africa. Africa will double from now to the year 2100. And that's really a, a massive change. And we'll also have to do a lot with how we operate and who are our partners. Who do we work with? In may maybe even for Quitster, that's one of the issues in the future. How, where are the markets, what are the consumers, where are the demands and where are the needs? And for the Europeans, bad news for us. We will shrink. We are now 10% of the world's population, but we will only be 5% in 2100. North America, you'll stay stable. You'll be 5% and you also grow a little bit, in, as you see here from the numbers, but together, North America and Europe will only be 10% of the world's population in the year 2100. So much for reality and uh, what's going on in our population dynamics. And I think that has a lot to do with how we work and who we work with in the future. Another mega trend, urbanization. This is a Chinese city, I don't know the name and probably even if I knew it, I would have forgotten, but we all know that there is massive development in big cities in China, but also other places. And um, urbanization is a trend uh, that also affects what are the demands, the interests, the values of people living in cities and what do they need 
for example, in our case, from forests. So this is something uh, that you need to consider also that um, so societies and their view on nature are constantly changing and are getting a more and more urbanized view. And uh, that is something also in the way how we operate and how we work, which we need to consider in our models of communication and in the case of research, transfer of knowledge to those changing societies. Consumption. This is something that we all know is, uh, is uh, debated quite a lot. And uh, now with uh, the um, issues about uh, the, the uh, war in Ukraine and the issue of uh, crops and feeding the world, I think it's very, very relevant and very much now a very uh, important topic we are discussing, how do we consume and what effects does it have? And that also has to do, of course, with forests, because very often there's a competition of land when we need to feed people, but also we need the resource of forests and trees. Digitalization, um, you know, I, um, if you talk to experts in that field, the question is not if digitalization will happen, it's only how fast it will happen. And I think we're realizing that, uh, I mean, you were talking about snail mail, and now, I mean, that's something we sometimes do, but uh, very rarely. We, we all use email, we all use other technologies. We are now used to, to use uh, Zoom or whatever devices that we learned to use in the COVID crisis. So it's going on, and it's going on at a very fast speed. And so also for our sectors and our work life, and also our private life. This is one of the developments that is very important and affecting our lives quite a lot. And finally, climate change. I mean, Andreas, you were hinting at that, and of course, we, that, that's very relevant, and many of us have been dealing with one or the other question on climate change uh, in, in, in our work lives. Uh, um, and uh, this uh, uh, chart is very well known, and we all know that uh, in the last uh, um, years, there's a massive increase in CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, which causes uh, climate uh, change effects. So, that is the frame, the big frame, my first six minutes. So, reboot the next six minutes. <laughs> the role of forests. There are many, many interests. And if you read that, I would subscribe to all of them. I mean, I like all of these. I would like to have them play a role in carbon storage. I would like them to have a nice biodiversity. Forests overall are the most important ecosystem when it comes to biodiversity globally. But I also like wood. I like the wooden furniture. I like wooden trees. I like paper. Um, and I also like to use uh, forest for my recreation. I like to go with a mountain bike. I like to hike and so on. So, and I mean, in the COVID crisis, you realize that, and studies show that, that many people, again, urban areas, had a much stronger push towards trees and, and forests surrounding them because we were locked down. So, so that effect of recreation health is also becoming more important with urbanized societies and crisis that, uh, as the COVID crisis that we have experienced. But what do we do with all these interests? Can we do and fulfill all this at the same time? And that is the challenge of the wider environment and forest policy ever. <laughs> and it's uh, also something we will have to deal with in the future. The sustainable development goals. I mean, you, I'm sure you all have heard about them and know them. They are the global frame for development of societies of the future. And these 17 goals, I mean, the goal 15 is the most common one uh, cited when it comes to forests and trees. It's life on land. But goal one, for example, alleviating poverty in many countries of the world also has to do a lot with forests and forestry. Two thirds of the population in, in the African continent need forests and trees for heating and cooking. So that uh, has a lot to do with how do we reduce poverty? And that is just one of the examples of many of those goals. But again, also here, implementing all the sustainable development goals at the same time, at the same speed, is not working. Because there are conflicts 
in speed and targets that you see here. And that again, when it comes to forests, has to do with the many interests that I've uh, shown you there. From the global level, we move down to the European Union level. There is a forest strategy. There always have been European Union forest strategies. Um, an interesting aspect from a policy perspective is there is no European Union forest policy as such in contrast to the climate policy or the biodiversity policy. There is no central European Union forest policy because countries in the European Union always stated that their independence, the so-called subsidiarity principle, is very important when it comes uh, to forests and dealing with forests. But the forest strategy formulates guidelines that could be, that could be fulfilled. And you, these sound quite reasonable and have to do with many aspects of sustainable forest management. Of course, in the details, there's a lot of discussion whether these are the right details to fulfill these issues. But what you see here is the reality of European Union policy making. There's a lot of different policies that regulate aspects of forests and forestry. Very importantly, of course, the climate policy, but also environment policy, energy policy, trade policy, and so on. And this is just a selection <laughs> of policies. It's really a selection to not make the picture too complicated. But there you see again, my first chart, the interests. They're also reflected here. And uh, somebody yesterday was talking about, uh, maybe you, you've on the silos. And, and very often policies are developed in a rather narrow way and, and the mindset of institutions working in that sector. And so the art is to combine these different interests reflected in these policies and to find ways forward to talk about trade-offs and solutions. This, for example, that's just climate policy issues on various levels. So you not only have the individual levels, but also you have the interrelation of levels. You have the international law, you have the European Union law, and then you have the national implementation laws. That's climate, but then you have biodiversity, bioeconomy, and so on and so on. So again, it shows you the complexity that forests and forestry uh, is in. And that's quite fascinating. So there's a lot of work to do, but um, it shows you again you can look at forests and trees from very different angles and have priorities uh, uh, formulated in many different uh, policy spheres. And, of course, there's also target conflicts that you then will see because you will not be able to fulfill all these the same goals at the same time at the same forest. So what is the future? Um, a very important aspect is uh, to identify the trade-offs. I think that's missing very often in the debates, that uh, it is not clear if you do A, what does it impact on B? If you have more carbon storage, what does it mean for energy? If you have more protected areas, what does it mean for wooden buildings? That's the new Bauhaus initiative in the European Union, for example. So. This is something that is very challenging and very demanding because of it also needs that you need to, to compromise. Um, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a joke about finding, finding synergies. I mean, a perfect synergy is between a horse and somebody riding the horse, provided you are not the horse. <laughs> and that's always the trick. That, of course, we always say, yeah, we, we need to work together. But you always then, ultimately, of course, you want to have your interest moved forward and not take on parts of the other ones. So that is, that is the complication of policy making in general, but especially forest policy, I think, and I, I hope I could show you, there's a lot of, uh, of, of issues because it's very complex and the interests behind it are very complex. The next six minutes, forest and climate change. Oh, yeah. This, uh, many years ago, we started uh, warming soil because we knew it's getting warmer and we tried to find out what's happening if we heat the soil. So this is a, a field plot in, um, in Tyrol, actually, and uh, so, so we could for many years model what will happen if the, if, if the temperature is rising and what does it mean for growth and, and, and uh, organisms in soil. But, I mean, 
the effects of climate change, I mean, you mentioned that also in the, in the, in the opening, we all know that, yeah? that there's these effects uh, and, uh, and um, meteorologists tell us that uh, these effects uh, because of the warmer atmosphere increase. So the, so the danger of uh, pests and diseases, wildfires and so on, increase because of the higher temperature. And that, of course, is something that is important for forests as an ecosystem, that they need to adapt to climate change. This is a chart uh, development of tree species in Europe. And uh, the base message is the oaks are the winners of, uh, the, uh, of all the tree species. Because that is uh, the prediction when it's getting warmer, oak trees will be the ones that will be um, favorable uh, to that climate uh, in comparison to many other tree species. And that is, of course, a very, it's a generalization, but it just shows that there's some dynamics. There's changes in, in the tree species, and that is very important to understand now, because, well, as we know, trees take some time to grow, and so th that we need to have that decision uh, made uh, with looking uh, at uh, time periods of 50 to 100 years. Just one example, this is Austria. And uh, the, the red dots is um, spruce trees in Austria. And uh, the, the first, uh, what you see up uh, at the slide is as it is now. And then left, you see how it's when the temperature rises 2.5 degrees and right uh, the corner, it's, uh, the temperature increases 5 degrees. And you see it's a lot more red dots. So it's not unexpected and you might have similar simulations for your own countries. But it's just a very, I think, um, visible uh, way of, of showing to forest owners, because we talk about reforestation and tree species and all that, what will happen if temperature and also precipitation changes uh, over the years. And we have found also some solutions or ways to inform forest owners and in the interested public. And it's a traffic light system, so it's very, very nice to understand. So Green is good, yellow, yeah, maybe, red, not good. I mean, we also can, you can cross the crossing by, uh, when it's red, that's okay, you can, <laughs> you can do that, but you, there's certain risks and danger, and that's also the case here with the tree species. And so we can provide quite, uh, quite some uh, information to, uh, to uh, forest owners, and that is one of the most important questions. When the phone rings, people ask, what should I plant? Uh, I, I plan a new forest, which uh, trees should I plant? And we can provide answers depending where you are, because here the case of Austria. Austria has a very many different ecosystems. You see here, I mean, the, the, the mountains, uh, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the and, and and other aspects that uh, have many different ecosystem parameters compared to more un to more um, um, landscapes that uh, are very similar for for quite a larger territory. So the traffic light system. And another message, of course, is you need mixed stands. So to share the risk. It's like when you, when you have your money put on the stock market. You do not want to put everything on one piece. You want to have a distribution of risk. And that's also the same here for the trees. We do not know exactly how all the trees will develop, how the um, also infestations or insect pathogens will develop. So you will try to spread the risk and have different tree species so you're sure that at least there's a very good chance that for the next 50 to 100 years you'll have a fit forest. Um, we um, haven't talked about the genetic diversity, but also that is, of course, something within tree species that might change how you look at a certain tree species. Um, you, you have to, uh, the same tree species, as you know, that can be more drought resistant uh, than, than in, in some regions uh, than in others. And so that also plays a very important role. Uh, because deer browsing was an issue, of course, hunting, the game managing game influence is a very important component of all of that. Um, we, we know that, and um, that needs to be th also implemented in line with uh, developing the forests for the future. And um, just to round that topic up, we talked about that yesterday a little bit. It's about how do you store carbon. That's the other role that forests play. The most important thing is we need to reduce CO2. So I think forests will not... Uh, 
solve all the problems we are having with the CO2 in the atmosphere. So it's really, and I come back to my consumption trend, it's about how do we develop as societies, how much CO2 do we emit, forests and wood products, and that's the message here, can store carbon for a certain period of time. And uh, if you use wood, uh, for especially in a long um, living way, then you can have an extra storage of carbon that you can that buys us time and can use some of the can take out carbon out of the atmosphere um, while we are f finding uh, intelligent ways uh, to uh, be more efficient and have new technologies to reduce our CO2 emissions. My last slides. Innovation, and I mean, talking to an audience uh, and talking to Quidstow, of course, that's something in your DNA, I guess. Innovation is a very important driver of how we develop in the future. And that's also true for, for using uh, wood and also how to develop and think about forests and trees and the forest sector. I talked about digitalization as a mega trend. And many of the things, I mean, we look at forests from the satellites now. So, so we have a masses of data that we interpret and where we can already um, say a lot of things about forests and trees uh, using satellites. And um, new ways of reforestation, because that's the also an overall topic. How do we do that? And I talked about the tree species, but it's also about helping um, for us to develop, uh, I think yesterday we had a discussion that the adaptation might not be fast enough on a natural way. You need to help them. That's the assisted migration so that you plant new tree species and uh, develop uh, a forest so that they can uh, survive a climate change um, uh, that, is, that is coming and so on. So it's really about thinking ahead, not uh, being mm, just relying on old traditions and old things that have worked because there will be new things that we need to come up with and that need to work. And finally, of course, the changing society. I think that is really something we have to cope with. I mean, we are part of that society. I think you know it with your own. We talked about our kids and, and families and so things are changing. And I think we have to take account what are the demands, what, what are they looking at and the role of forests also in a circular bioeconomy, that is a concept of a sustainable society for the future, where forests and trees play a very important role. And last but not least, of course, also jobs will change. We will have new jobs uh, that, uh, that are developing, jobs that we are doing now shift and might have new, new aspects. So it's a dynamic uh, uh, development also from a societal perspective. So the last slide, megatrends shape also forests and trees and the sector that, that deals with all these aspects. Um, forests and wood products are a very important resource for changing and helping to change society and uh, forest policy, of course, as um, a steering um, element will need also to be uh, looked at in a very integrative way and uh, to uh, talk about uh, moving forward to meet the interests that I was also showing to you at the very beginning. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope I could give you the big picture. Factor forest and trees in, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Peter. Please stay on stage for your, thank you for your uh, astonishing uh, presentation. It had much to do with my introduction, but, introduction, but it's okay. <laughs> what we want to do now, we ha want to have now a panel discussion about who owns the forest. I want to welcome here on stage my uh, next two panelists. First, uh, Anna Treskov. She is um, from, the policy, from the Policy Expert Federation of Swedish Family Forest Owners. A big applause for Anna Treskov. Please take a seat here. And last but not least, Brian Roth, he's a forest research consultant from, he's, you have two nationalities. You're, you're from Canada and from, you represent United Canada States. and the US. Correct. You're the perfect panelist here. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the topic is who owns the forest? And uh, in, the, in the first round, we want to learn about how, uh, who, about the ownership in your perspective countries. You may uh, start, Brian. Yeah, okay, thank Who you. are the owners in the US and in Canada? Yeah. Uh, I'll start with uh, Canada. 
to the north. Uh, most of Canada is 90% publicly uh, owned forest land. About a third of the area is in forest land, and of that, 90% is public. So 10% is in private land, mostly distributed on the east coast. Uh, the private l forest landowners, fairly small with a few big landowners, uh, industry, and a little bit on the west coast. In the United States, it's the other way around. We have 56% of the forest area in private lands. Uh, those are concentrated mainly in three areas, in the southeast, in the northeast, and on the west coast. And that's how the ownership works. The, the federal land is mostly on the eastern part of the United States. Okay, so we will later on speak about managing forests, so mm -hmm. I guess it's, it's, uh, it's quite a difference between the US and Canada, there is. managing forests. There is, and it depends on who owns the forest and what yeah. the objectives are. Okay, Anna, Anna, how is it in uh, in Sweden? In Sweden, uh, about seventy-five percent is privately owned, which fifty percent, approximately, are small-scale family forest owners, and uh, about fifteen, uh, twenty-five percent are uh, public companies, but privately owned, and about fifteen percent, I think, about, uh, are the, the state. Uh, and it, it's really important that this this structure is uh, has really shaped our country, the culture, the the, the landscape, the housing, and uh, uh, what we see. I think it was a really good uh, explanation about all the international trends. And one of the trends that is constant and a discussion, you know, the philosophical question of who owns the forest. And it's mm. in our liberal uh, democracies, the legal systems have said that there is some such a thing as uh, pr private ownership, the property rights. But there are, of course, always um, waves in society that are challenging those for different kinds of reason and, and more and more claims are being put that, you know, nobody owns the forest. Uh, which is sad that we heard yesterday that there uh, is more sustainability in the, the, you know, the close and privately owned and managed forests. More sustainability. And um, how big are the, the average areas? Um, actually, I'm a lawyer, so I, I don't really know uh, the average, but I've heard something like four... Uh, Mm, no, maybe some of the Swedes that are more into the natural sciences can help me with this, but it varies a lot in our la landscapes. Uh, like there are bigger uh, uh, areas owned in the north of Sweden where it grows slowly, and, and there are uh, uh, smaller areas in the in, in the southern parts. Okay. And and there is also, of course, different kinds of s structure like the 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 big estates and the smaller. Uh, uh, farm uh, estates, but I, I, I don't really have a figure of the average uh, uh, small-scale family forest owner when it comes to the forest. Okay, we have uh, some Swedish people here uh, in the audience. Could 50 hectares. 50 okay. hectares, he's the expert. Yeah, <laughs> <Know him from laughs> everything yesterday. that has Thank to do you. with natural size, uh, I have, I'm just a lawyer. <laughs> We're not going to change. <laughs> 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 no, and, and you also said uh, before, when we talked that uh, you have a lot of uh, women as owner? Yes, uh, of those uh, 40, uh, well, 40 percent of the uh, family forest owners are actually women. So it's one of the uh, business areas where there are more, more, there is more gender equality, if you, if you call it. Oh, that's yeah. typical, that's typical Sweden. And, <laughs> and Peter, and yeah, it's, it's true, they are in front, front runners. Mm -hmm. uh, um, Peter, and uh, in Austria, we heard yesterday we have a lot of private yeah. ownership. No, it's very similar to Sweden. So it's 82% privately owned. Okay. Then you have uh, 50... So it's a lot more it's privately Yeah, but it's, it's 75 in Sweden, so it's not that much. So it's a little more than oh yeah. in Sweden. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and then you have 15%, which is the Austrian federal forest, so public forest land. And then you have a few percent other public forest owners like churches and so on. So, so it's a very large portion. I, I think it, it's the second highest figure in Europe. I think the highest is Portugal, interestingly. But it's uh, so mm -hmm. then, then it's Austria with 82 percent. But Europe is very different. I mean, I'm not sure if, if there are colleagues from Poland, for example. But Poland, for example, has uh, uh, 90 percent public uh, forest land. So, so, so the situation in Europe is very varying and, and very, very different. 
And uh, that makes it quite um, interesting. I was talking about European Union policy because uh, it's a difference if you as a, as a yeah. state are the forest owner or if, you're, if, if your country relies on private ownership because, of course, the impact on laws are very different and also the implementation of laws is very different uh, in these two ownership categories. So that makes, uh, makes it always in the discussion phase also, also quite, uh, quite lively, you guess you can imagine, these and different is, ownership patterns. Is there a sort of tendency you see, okay, <coughs> where we have a lot of private owners that treat the, wo the, the forest better than uh, the state? Or is there a tendency or is it just an idea? So, so in, no, in the case of Austria, that there, is, there, is, there is no difference because there is, of course, legal frames and the forest law and uh, other, uh, nature conservation laws uh, and so on and so on that f provide the frame that you have to operate in. It, it defines very clearly what you should do, what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do. So. Yeah, but, but I think Sweden we can also? say in Sweden, as the discussion is going, is that is for sure the state-owned forests are not managed in a better and more sustainable way than the private-owned ones. That okay. is for sure. And as I said yesterday during a question, we can also see that in the formally protected areas, we see certain uh, uh, values uh, like biodiversity, etc. There is actually declining so that you could you can have formally protect an area because of its natural values and then after a couple of years when it's not managed anymore it's the the these values disappears and uh, maybe this is only a transition y yes but, uh, only but right now maybe in yeah. 20 years it's 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 a better forest than it was before the, but that's in but a, but said the expert to this argument because it's very interesting. She says, if you don't manage it, it gets worse. May I just continue that, uh, that sentence? Because uh, that might be a better, what is better in the eye of the beholder, but uh, the reason why it was originally protected, those values disappear. But then some others, because like nature is not a picture, it's a movie. But then it might be better in some other way, but this then is another way. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Brian, uh, in yeah. the United States? S similar trends in, in North America that the privately owned forest is managed better and more intensively for So you production. see a difference. There is really a difference. difference. There is a difference. So better yeah. forests in, in Canada than in the US. No, reverse. No. <laughs> reverse. No, within each country, let's not get into a, a global okay. <laughs> trade dispute. Because I we don't do want to divide you. <laughs> no, because we do already have a softwood lumber trade dispute yes. that's been going on for <laughs> a number of decades. Okay. Um, but within each country, the, the privately managed forests are more productive uh, for the products that are being used by society. Now, okay. ecosystem services, that's a different story. Yeah. And we don't have a price on those yet. Yeah. That's a mm. so, so economically, it's better. They are better, uh, the private ones. And a lot of times, the private landowners have uh, a, f a manufacturing facility that they're trying to feed. So this is the incentive to produce uh, to feed their mills. Uh, yeah, Peter, you want maybe, I think it's an interesting point because, I mean, globally, of course, there's a, and I think yesterday, maybe Hans, you, you were mentioning that the issue is about combining all these different aspects or segregating them. And of course, I mean, in North America, in part, there's a segregation of, uh, of services that you, that you use forests for. So if you, you have intense harvesting on some parts, but then you have large areas which are protected. Whereas here in, the, in, in Central Europe, with our cultural history and also our industrial history 300 years ago, we have developed an, an incorporating multifunctional thinking about how we treat our ecosystems and try to combine these different interests and aspects in forests and, and providing so-called semi-natural ways of moving a, a forestry and forests forward. But that's not the same in many countries uh, um, uh, worldwide. We were I was talking about Latin America or or Africa, but uh, especially in Latin America, you see sometimes a strong segregation of where you have plantations where you just produce timber, and th and that's uh, and that's uh, so there's a difference globally also on how forest and forestry is done. Yeah, I think that's Anna? really important because there are such clear trends when it comes to forestry, and we see like in Sweden before 1993, then the Swedish authority actually forced landowners. To, to take away diversity in trees and manage forests in a way that is not even legal today. So uh, uh, this means, so what will the next trend be? And, and that's one of the reasons our forestry is actually protected by our constitution. 
so that you could uh, you you should be able to to use it in 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 the best type of way. Otherwise, you should be reimbursed. Mm -hmm. But but the, the, it's interesting to see these trends. So if the state controls and the laws are they they are fulfilling what what everyone thinks is the best uh, con conduct mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know if people do uh, d uh, what is what would seem to be, then they were forbidden to do what is best conduct today, uh, before uh, before the 90s, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, so what, what, there are two aspects that, that are also quite quite um, relevant of, to, the, to your question, who owns the forest, is also uh, that uh, because in countries like Austria, when you have 82% of private ownership, the question is, are you allowed to enter the forest if it's privately owned? Yeah. And there was a, a principal decision in the 1970s, where f from then on, everyone's right is to walk and hike in, the for in every forest in Austria. Yeah. So there's no exclusion whether it's private or public land, so you can have all the forests for, for, for hiking. And for hiking, yes, but not for biking. For no. biking, there are dedicated uh, uh, the trails, and, and that's also a long and political debate, yeah. of course, as we all know. And um, But uh, in contrast to some other countries uh, where all the forest roads are, uh, are free for, for biking, in Austria there's dedicated roads, and there are advantages and disadvantages advantages for both sides. Mm -hmm. yeah, but that's a different... We, we can talk about that as well. But <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think the principal issue is about also... Uh, how and, and because um, you, you mentioned how do people feel about forests and I think you, you've experienced that, that that they think it's my forest everyone yeah because it's I can hike there and and then that why, why the conflicts also sometimes arise when trees are cut again especially in urban areas mm -hmm. peri urban areas people don't understand the rhythm of nature that you have to cut a tree to produce uh, a nice uh, wooden floor or a nice wooden table and and um, that that is something that has to do with the emotions uh, yeah. that it's my forest and and and, and there's a, a tree is cut uh -huh. where where it is a private forest owned by somebody else in reality. Okay. Brian, how it is in North America? Uh, because because when you uh, I know I, I was in the states once and mm -hmm. if you want to go through a meadow or something it. It's a free country, and it's only fences. I only saw fences. You couldn't; they will shoot you down if you, <laughs> yeah. if you. What is the, how it is with the forests? You can go inside forests. Yeah. So you land tenure think? is important, right? Uh, in in Canada, where we have mostly crown land, which is the public land, yeah. there is right of access. L right of access. So the companies have a tenure to the forest in a license that lasts a certain length of time, but they don't own the land. And they'll build roads, and the public can use those roads and access the forest and see the forest management in, in, up close and personal. And sometimes they're not that excited about seeing how the forest is managed mm -hmm. because it is their forest. Mm -hmm. But the government has given a private company the rights to manage that forest for a given length of time. And uh, how you see the differences in, in law we have in, in Austria, and uh, as I heard also in Sweden, there are pretty strong forestry laws. We are proud of it in Austria and Germany and Switzerland. We're proud. We have it since the 19th century. How is it in, the, in, in North America? Well, I can talk to Canada first uh, in that there are regulations that before the company is allowed to harvest the timber, they need to have a plan to yeah. reforest it. Okay. And so Canada like manages, here. just like here, we manage on a sustainable forest uh, um, production, uh, sustainable forestry. Uh, it's a 200-year planning horizon. And they need to have, uh, you know, all of the regulations uh, involved in reforestation and managing that forest so that the amount that is cut equals what is harvested for the annual allowable cut that's calculated based on our, our growth and yield models and proje projections. So it's very sustainable. In the United States, on the private land, to get back to the original question about access, uh, Private land ownership is, is quite um, strict there. And as a private landowner, we don't have the, um, you, you can restrict access to your property. So it's not the Allemansrat in, in Sweden, for example, and here in, in Austria where you can travel anywhere within certain regulations. But I think, uh, Tom, you need to have it posted, right? You have to have a sign up for people because of this legal part, right? That it okay. says every so many meters, there has to be a sign that says this is private land. So, so what, what yours is yours in, 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 in the States and in, in, in mm. Canada? Because in, in Austria, if you dig down and you get some oil, yeah. 
It's not yours. That's correct. <laughs> What's been underneath, I guess, 10 meters yeah. is from its estate. You, it's not yours. But in, in, if you if you get if you no, there's similar similar rules in, in North America. <laughs> really, I, just I thought if you find rate. oil on your in your uh, no land, it's yours. No, you have to have the the rights from the government okay. to, mm. to drill for that, and then you, you need the correct. landowner permission to access the land to drill for that. Unless you can drill horizontally yeah. and drill from your neighbor <laughs> and go underneath and get it. Okay, okay, fracking, fracking. No, uh, uh, in in order to cover our basics, mm. last question about mm. basics, uh, just that we know what we are talking about. If if we think about a scale from zero to ten, and zero is a wild forest, and ten is a is is like a cornfield, mm -hmm. so an intensively used forest. Where do you see your countries? If you s we start in Sweden, is it a five or is it a four or um, or depends if it's the state? No, you have the laws for e everyone. So. Yes, I mean we have uh, between five to ten, but it it varies. It it's and how the, uh, maybe I'm going to answer this in a uh, as a lawyer because I can't really <laughs> <laughs> answer the question with the yes and no. Uh, the, the, some of the big state-owned companies, uh, where they uh, they have a, I, I think, a harder uh, uh, use of the forest, whereas the family uh, uh, managed forest uh, less, and then there are the protected areas. So, and and it, we have a big country, so it's it's actually varies so much, and that's the important thing with forestry. There is no size fits all. There is no no way of managing that is uh, working everywhere. But if you force me, I would say maybe uh, eight or A B A B S eight such. That, so high. Uh, oh, that is that when it's. Oh, could you tell me again? The a ten is worse. Th no, oh, no, it's not worse. worse. It's, it's good two. for the industry. Okay, th then it's two. It's two. It's r it's well it's, managed. It's close to a, a wild forest. Yeah, uh, really pretty close. Yeah. We're we gonna Two, ask a, a professional guy, a yeah. forester, <laughs> who is okay. every day outside. Yeah, you know, yeah I think that's better. What do you think? What number would you give? Uh, first of all, what's uh, sorry? What was your name? My name is An Andreas. Oh. Okay. Oh. Very good. Okay. <laughs> applause, Anna. Thank you. <laughs> so, I asked for permission for permission to bounce back all these kinds of questions. Okay. Oh. So, <laughs> which figure? Big difference in scale uh, in the South Sweden, where yeah. most of the land is privately owned. The average clear cut is two hectares. If you go up to the north, where the state and the big companies own most of the forest, the average. Clearcast is 10 times bigger, like 10, uh, 20 hectares. Mm -hmm. so, so that means that the north of Sweden, where there is less population, and the south of Sweden, where there are lots of people, differs quite a lot. Okay. Both in ownership structure where the and people in see it less forest exactly. management. Okay, that's that's interesting. Which figure would you give, Peter, for... No, it would be, it would be very similar. I mean, we've... Uh, done a, it's called biodiversity index for Austria, so it's a quite an innovative tool, I think it's quite unique in, in Europe, and we've, um, it's, it's like uh, a, uh, an ATX, which is, uh, or, or, or uh, uh, stock exchange rating, so we try to come up with one figure, how do we do, and it's about, uh, from 0 to 100, it's around 60. But uh, um, 100 would be total uh, uh, old growth and, and undisturbed nature, which is, is unrealistic in a cultural landscape like Europe. So you maximum you could reach maybe maybe 90 points or something like that. So and we see an and we see an up up here. Uh, so we, we see an, uh, a development in the right direction. So, yeah. so, so more di diversity, more mixed tree species, and all that. But so so this is. Uh, Something that has to do, of course, with, with, with the, the development and the history of our country. So now you're talking like a lawyer. Uh, which <laughs> figure? No, no. Two to three. <laughs> Two to three. Okay, like Sweden. And okay, that, that's good. I, uh, uh, this gentleman here in the what do you, you want to add something, please? Uh, I have to oppose on, on this uh, yeah. figure from yeah. Sweden. I, I made an a estimate and published a, a paper in, in the Journal of Sustainable Forestry. Okay. When Where are I, you from? Sorry. Uh, I'm from uh, Umeå University in northern Sweden. Ah. And um, uh, Stig Olof Holm is my name. Uh, so, uh, based on uh, the forestry inventory data since 1950, uh, I estimated that if you go north from River Dalälven, which is northern yeah. Sweden, uh, approximately 30% had been converted to pine monocultures in 2010. 
and this long ago. So its large part is just the green desert in the north, mm -hmm. but it differs in the south because it's more of private owned lands. So it's more of well, where, where it, say, more in, include, included mixed forest and so on. But in the north where the, the big forest company rules, it's just, just converted. The okay, landscape. what does green desert mean? Yes, a green desert, it's <laughs> just that you have replaced a ah. ordinary seminary, okay. a semi-natural forest with a, a tree plantation in different ages, so to say. And, and Tom Sayer, thank you very much, Professor Holm. Uh, Tom Sayer, what? Uh, Uwe. Uwe, sorry. Sorry, Mr. Sayer, Uwe, Sayer, uh, uh, what do you? That's not the what figure do you see in, in, in Germany, in or Germany. you also know a little bit the situation? Maybe I mean, I'm, in coming, I'm coming from this heated debate around um, certification, what is good. I mean, the transfer process going into more natural dynamic issues. I would give it a, 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 a less good figure, maybe three to four in Germany. Not okay. saying not differs too much. No? Yeah, but, okay. but it's not a two and it's not a three more. It's more a four in a way. Okay. And, and, and it, it's, well, how is that based? I would say it's justified through, I mean, look at the, at the, at the, at the diseases currently, at, at the droughts and the result of the droughts. So the conditions of German forests, when you look at, at spruce or pine forests, it's not as good. It's, it's more like a historical um, based um, change in the wrong direction, which is now kind of, which we now see the results through climate change, but also through, through other things. And so I, it's not more than, a, maybe I would give it more four than three in Germany. In Germany. Okay, thank you very much. You see, we, we have our differences, of course, and that's no, why we are here. Absolutely, no, and that, that is what I was talking also about the interests earlier. I mean, there the, the, the are reflections of different priorities and, and angles yeah. that you can look at for us. Okay, now I want to talk uh, more about reforestation. Um, uh, uh, you also could start, Peter. Uh, uh, Peter, Peter, who is responsible for sustainable reforestation here in Austria? Well, it's it's again, it's it's all the owners. It's a forest law that, uh, similarly as, as Brian has just mentioned, it's it's your responsibility if you harvest, you have to reforest and replant so that you have a sustainable system. And so it, it's it's clearly everyone's uh, every owner's uh, duty. The same to do rules that. for everyone. Yes, yeah. same rules for everyone. May, may I just add one thing, because uh, we were talking about uh, uh, sizes and ownership again, just to come back to that. But when the 82%, half of that is owned by, by owners that own less than 200 hectares. So, so the average size is 9 hectares in Austria, so compared to 50 in Sweden, so okay. it's really small. So that uh, it's, it's, it's 150,000 owners. So, so it, that, that also explains the, that it's important to have laws that applies to everyone, because it's so many. Yeah. Uh, some very often farmers that have a little bit of land or some of the Austrians here present might have inherited uh, a little bit, bit of forest of the ancestors and so on, which is a very classic way of, of how forests uh, are ju just uh, maintained. Uh, but there's a, it's, it's a, there's a lot of diversity in, in ownership. Okay, and, and uh, what, what comes before uh, reforestation often is clearing. Mm -hmm. um, how is it in Austria? And, uh, how, how big is the area we are allowed to clear? Yeah. I mean, I think that is also one of the big differences globally and on how, how big your, the, the, the clear cuts uh, are. And we see, we sometimes in the media we see these large areas uh, cleared in the Brazil uh, rainforest and so on. And, and that, of course, is very different to, the, for example, Austria. So the normal size would be 0 0.5 hectares and the maximum, and then you need uh, uh, some, 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 some legal certificate, is 2 hectares. So this is a very, in comparison to many other countries, is a very small uh, uh, portion of land. Okay, how's it in Sweden? I think we already discussed that uh, it's about two hectares, yeah. but larger in the privately owned companies, and, and it is the duty of the landowner to uh, replant the trees. So generally there are two uh, new trees uh, planted for every one that is cut down. But I also want to say that a long time ago, uh, there was some uh, deforestation in Sweden too, like mm. hundreds of years ago. So, uh, so you did have to put back plants so to some sort of monoculture. But it's, it, again, it's a bit a, a trend and it's eye of the beholder because some may call it green deserts, but we see many of our traditional paintings, you have these 
orderly trees because that was a sign of of civilization you know uh, the man managing nature and, and being able to provide for themselves so that was uh, uh, well what do you say the trend by then and in fashion and and we can also see these days that there are some people that are uh, really biologically interested they want to see a really wild unmanaged trees whereas the general public who wants to roam and uh, uh, go out and bike in the forest they generally prefer the managed forests so i think there are so many di uh, it's complicated in, in in different areas don't you agree yes uh, absolutely yeah. what, what we learned uh, yesterday from susan simar was uh, she prefers let let alone the the the, the mother th mother trees mm -hmm. and the big trees and only cut off a few uh, a few trees what do you think about this I mean, th there's, uh, I think uh, we mentioned that yesterday, I think Hans mentioned that there, there, there is a system that is selective logging and, and it, it depends a little bit on the ecosystem, but that implies exactly the same system that's yeah. used. And in, in, in principle, it's a little different, of course, what she was portraying. But is it used, selected logging? It is, yes, it is. In, in which percentage? Um, I don't know the percentage, I have to confess, uh, but uh, not very high. So, so in, in comparison to, to small it's still clear something, cuts, yeah. something new. No, it, it's there for a long time, but uh, but not all terrain and not all uh, ecosystems are, are built for that, to do that. What about clear cuts in, in the US or in Canada? Are, are they different in the areas and how they do it? Yeah, so you have to go back to the ownership patterns again. So in Canada, we're 90% public land and the tenure is uh, allocated at the provincial and territorial level. So at the, in the regions, each province sets their own uh, regulations that are associated with the tenure to harvest that timber. And so those regulations can vary by region from where Suzanne was in British Columbia. It's different to Alberta where I live, uh, to the eastern part of Canada, it's very different. So in Alberta, I can speak to the fact that it's almost 100% clear cut. Mm -hmm. And this type of harvesting is kind of in line with our natural disturbances. So we have a, a, a fire-dominated system mm. in most of Alberta. Where in line means disturbance, it's the same size? Uh, in line means uh, we're trying to match our managed uh, forest systems to what we see in nature. So if the disturbance is by fire, then we look at the fire return interval. If it's about 40 years, we should be doing clear cutting uh, on roughly average every 40 oh, years. Oh, you try to across copy? Across the landscape. Yeah, you mimic nature. Okay. It's not the same, of course. Uh, so we do the best we can. And now that we have some changing climate and things are speeding up, we have insects and diseases, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. we should be changing our regulations to keep up. And that's mm -hmm. probably the biggest debate that we need to be having is our regulations were built for a previous era and they need to, we need to catch up so that we can be more nimble and adaptive and let our, our forest managers be quick to uh, come up with some responses to what we're seeing because we're falling behind with our reforestation especially because the regulations were built for a different time. Mm -hmm. I, I, I remember, please correct me, but I... In preparation of this talk, uh -huh. I saw at the TED talk, uh, TED talk she has three, on, uh, you, you find it easy on YouTube, uh, of Susan Zimmer, and uh, there was one especially really good uh, TED talk, and she, I hope I'm, I'm, I'm correct, but she said that Canada is destroying as much wood as Brazil, Brasilia, Brazil? I'm not as sure. much forest In area? Canada? Yeah, in area, because you have, for example, the oil sand. And if you if you look at you're destroying a lot of forest. Destroying forest? Like yeah, it's not true. Uh, it's terminology probably. Uh, or if clearing, you're talking or about deforestation. Ah, deforestation. Uh, I think that's the buzzword these days, deforestation. Yeah. And yeah. it's not true. In Canada, we're managing on a sustainable okay. sustainable forest. So when we harvest the forest, we're going to replace that forest. Okay. Uh, when you talk about areas, Canada is a very big area, yeah. so we're um, managing a lot of forests. And, and so it's not deforestation, it's, uh, it's um, sustainable forest management. So if they are clearing uh, an area of forest for to, get to, to come to the, to the oil sand, mm -hmm. uh, then it's legal. They just do it. Well, yes, of but course. the the rights of the the tenure holder to, to drill for oil uh, and yeah. remove the oil, they have to restore this back to the way it was. 
okay. when they're finished. So it's really just an access issue that they need to do certain infrastructure in order to access that oil, but then they need to uh, restore the land back to the way it was. Now, not exactly every piece needs to be the same way it was before, but the matrix and the, the jigsaw puzzle overall has to be what the ecosystem looked like before they went in to disturb it. Okay. So we have a lot of research and effort, especially in Alberta with our oil sands and oil uh, development in how to rehabilitate or restore those areas back. So to take it from bare mineral soil and put back the topsoil, put back the drainage systems okay. and then replant the shrubs and trees, it's quite a bit of effort to make it look similar to the way it was, but that's a requirement. Uh That's so, good to know. Mm -hmm. That's good to know. Yeah. That's good. Gives me a good feeling. Maybe, uh, but this is a very important word: this deforestation and the issue about destroying or not destroying, and and it has to do with 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 uh, the environmental aspect of forests and biodiversity. So I think it is very clear that that is a very important uh, aspect when you look at forests that that uh, this uh, that they are maintained and that also the biodiversity is maintained. Um, but um, the um, the net rate of forest loss worldwide is still four million hectares per year, and that. That's why it's very often it's some that's figures of the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. So and, and that is why why also in the public communication very often forests are seen that they are in danger because we mm. very often are confronted yeah. with pictures coming from Brazil, coming from Indonesia, I don't know. Mm -hmm. With land and, and land conversion is one of the main uh, reasons for that. So conversion into agriculture. So and again this has to do with our consumption because mm -hmm. we've yeah, so so it's again mega trends. Okay. And and so but, but that is why 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 there are so many aspects and you have to look at regions and at countries in a different way because it's not this we have learned our lessons in Europe basically okay. because 300 years ago we were at the same system we for industrialization mm -hmm. we've used our forests and uh, we knew that cannot be the future so we need to have a, a sustainable resource yeah and yeah and so so in the, but in, again that's why it's emotion and an emotional debate and where you see these different angles and interests and uh, you find, find uh, the, the solutions and have to also clarify communication what are we talking about okay i have to ask again one question yeah. to you brian uh, uh, talking of wildfires I have I have the impression here in Europe you have more wildfires than you had before. Is it true or is it not true? Are we losing forest in total in in these boreal forests uh, which are very worthy? So it may not be the number of wildfires, but the size. The size. That uh, they're occurring earlier in the season. So in the springtime, we have a lot of dead grass. Uh, the trees don't have the leaves out yet. And so we have uh, a fire season that's really fixated on that early part of the growing season. Mm -hmm. And with climate change, that's moving. So now we've expanded the length of time uh -huh. that those plants are in, and trees are in that condition. So your, your exposure, your risk uh, is much higher because any kind of ignition mm -hmm. can then spread a big wildfire. Okay. So this is a change due to climate change that it's not something that hadn't been happening before, but the risk has grown because the and, hazard and is there. Is your response like in Austria that we are looking for new species uh, you tr uh, when it comes to reforestation? Well, I would go more towards assisted migration because mm -hmm. in North America, we have a large area and we can get species from within North America and move them further north. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot like of it happened work. all uh, in, in the million of years. Uh, well, yeah, over time with over the time. glaciers retreating from the south and going to the north, the, the trees would follow, but it takes a long time. And so we have such speed now that we're going to have to predict what the climate is going to be like in 40 years so that we know what we should plant there now. Mm -hmm. And in British Columbia, for example, they've adjusted the regulations to build in uh, the assisted migration mm -hmm. so that they can predict what the, based on where they think they're going to be with climate, they can predict which uh, source of tree Uh, seed, they should move to that area now mm -hmm. so that it'll be ready when it's time to, to experience those conditions. So you have to do a little bit of forecasting mm -hmm. and prediction about where the climate is adapted for those trees where you're sourcing the seed mm -hmm. as to where it's going to go. So they've developed some very nice um, models so that you can say, I want to plant over here, where can I get that seed? Mm. It can come from these areas. Or I have the seed that I've developed, where can it be planted? Mm. And that's part of the regulations now. And that's just this year that that's mm. come about. Uh, 
And Anna, in, in, here in Austria, this uh, migration thing is pretty emotional. People, oh, this is a foreign tree, we don't want it. How is it, is it in Sweden? The, I don't think that, that that is not yet a big discussion in my world. I'm sure it is for the people who are actually <laughs> in, in doing the research, but we're not, uh, in my world, uh, it's not a, a, a big issue and it's not debated in, in public a lot either, but may, it, probably in your world of research it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is debated quite a lot, uh, especially in the north where, where uh -huh. they have introduced American lodgepole pine. The indigenous people, the Sapmi, are, are very uh -huh. against that. Mm. Uh, and according to the FSC rules of Sweden, we are now only allowed to have 5% five, five of the area in your forest estate with foreign tree species. Okay. So it has, has changed a lot. And, and I would say that the ecologists of Sweden are, are quite race, racist. They hate everything for it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what's your perception, Peter? Because, yeah. uh, to be honest, if you see it as a climatologist, we had through the centuries always no forest, new forest, uh, the, the trees coming from all over the world, even from, as you said yesterday, the which tree comes from, from Central America? Pine you? Yeah, the origin of the pine trees. Was the, the pine trees on are migrants. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so uh, no. I mean, from a scientific. Uh, <laughs> no, it, it's it's. it's I mean, the, 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 the non-native tree species. I, I always I mean foreign. It always sounds so <laughs> averse. Yeah. So yeah. it's a non-native tree species, and and it has a lot to do again with. Uh, how does also biodiversity develop in times of climate change? And and uh, and uh, and um, because you mentioned the ecologists, uh, I mean also uh, nature conservation sometimes has a tendency to be too too um, not flexible enough to uh, to, to be too yeah. much too st um, stuck into old concepts. So when I was talking about innovation and thinking ahead, so also that we have to think how will it develop, and it's a very important component again. But also non-native tree species, as you say, nature has always evolved, and if that is the future of forests rather than not having forests, then it makes sense to introduce tree species that will maintain a forest also for the for the future. But it's a it's again it's an it's a debate. It's it's it has different points of view, but, but it's something that we, for example, do uh, research on and um, do recommend. But it's a forest as good as before. But what yep. this, if the species change, uh, the, the, how is it called, Fichte, Sprouse? If you lose the Sprouse in Austria. Spruce. Mm -hmm. The Spruce, Spruce, yeah. Spruce, sorry. Spruce, also in, 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 in Sweden. Um, uh, if you lose the Spruce, isn't that a problem for, for uh, the companies? And <laughs> well, Spruce. Because it's, it's, it's a good team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's so. First of all, I mean, I, I did show you this Austrian map with the red dots and the green dots, and there were still many green yeah. dots. So, so, so we will not lose spruce, but it will change where it will grow. And there's a lot of natural areas, also from an ecosystem point of view, yeah. where spruce is the natural tree species here, Kitzbühel yeah. mountains. Yeah, so it will always be there. The but you have regions where it ha has been grown, where it should not have been grown in the past. That's very clear. And I mean, because you mentioned also Germany, so there are parts that c comes out of the logic of the Second World War that, 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 that you needed resources for rebuilding the society and so on. Many, many arguments, and because it takes so long, now we see the effects that that probably then is, was a good decision, but not for today. So we will not lose spruce, but we will have a lot of more other trees and more broadleaf trees, which have has a different uh, quality of timber than, than, than spruce. And that, of course, is a very big issue for industry. Yes. And, uh, and that is one of the issues, again, innovation, technology, efficiency. How will industry have react on that? Have you room to move? Have you room? Is there it's from again those five, five you know, trees who are good? Yeah, yeah. I want this one because it's the better timber. That there, there is a certain element where you can substitute spruce, if that is your, your yeah. question. Yeah. But, uh, but not in all aspects. And uh, again, it's a, global, it's, a, it's a global view. I mean, even now, all our countries all are exporters, but also importers. And when I was talking about different concepts and ways how timber is produced in, in some of the regions of the world, you might be still able to produce tree species that are might be also attractive for industry, which is very often also globalized. As, well, so companies are not national anymore. So we are already uh, talking about the challenges of reforestation. What are the biggest challenges in, Swe in Sweden? Um, if you're uh, thinking also of laws, not, also not yes. only of the climate change. So 
uh, even though we have a strong, uh, we have a uh, the, the uh, forestry protected in the constitution, we have a, a strong support from the public and from the parliament. We have seen s still seen from a long time challenges from NGOs and from some authorities actually working quite harshly against forestry in a way that unfortunately uh, strikes really hard towards the small scale farmer who is actually mm -hmm. probably out on the tractor a day, is maybe milking the cows, and then uh, a huge amount of administration, etc., is making it more and more difficult for the small scale farmers. And uh, our, uh, this started to happen slowly, and uh, people woke up and started to realizing it. And we have had more and more initiatives to, to, to strengthen the property rights because that is the actual will of the country. But, but it is so, so it's still a little bit going on, but, but the awareness has woken, it uh, has become better. But then all of a sudden, uh, a number of initiatives started coming from EU, and it's I really initiate, initi initiated by the same uh, group of NGOs and in a, approximately the same way, uh, uh, which and, and since it's mostly done in an unconstitutional, unconstitutional ways, the, the means to work against it has not been there. And, and also now, since this really couldn't happen, our politicians and our parliamentaries in the Union, uh, they, uh, the officials, they were not preferred prepared, so uh, it, it took a long time uh, for them to wake up, same with Finland, but now they did, so they are actually strengthening their work within the EU because there you had a, a list of, of uh, initiatives coming, uh, uh, also in the field of forestry, which is outside their competence, it is a national competence because of the, the diversity in our different countries, but I would say that is the main uh, problem today for the, th that is the acute problem today for the small scale uh, farmer foresters. Mm -hmm. And it has a little bit to do with digitalization yeah. too, that, uh, uh, and, and it's done uh, uh, through uh, administration. You, you try to administrative, uh, administrate away the possibility to do forestry. Uh, in your opinion, is the EU a help or would it be nicer and easier and no, the without without the legislation from the EU? Oh, the EU, uh, in my, in our point of view, is actually they they have no grounds for for uh, most of their initiatives, and and it's actually not based on on the 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 the, the, the right decisions. So okay. we 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 really, uh, and I know that, that our officials uh, and the Finnish ones are working really hard and try to get the, the Commission in particular to, to realize uh, the way things work in Sweden. Because it's, it's due to a lot of, uh, what do you call it these days, fake news, et, et cetera, and, ah. and um, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that, that, that is the, the main threat at the moment. Okay, it, life will be easier without Brussels. Uh, how is it in, <laughs> in, in Austria? No, of course the European Union is wonderful. <laughs> no, I <laughs> no, have no, no problem, no. but sometimes there are some laws <laughs> you think, why no, do we need no, this? But that, yeah, yeah, but, but so, no, again, but we have to state that but in general as, as a, as a, very good, as a peace project and all that, so we should not question the EU as no, such. No, no, I no, but no, no, but no, <laughs> but, but, but now when it comes to, 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 to the forest you know policy, forest. You, have, you have the, you, again, you, you see the different interest groups um, and also the politicians, and when I was talking about changing societies and value systems, Systems that change with the, with societies. You of course have a reflection of the policymakers in Parliament and our own, because those are the people that that uh, mirror the interests of, of society, and those are changing or they have been changing towards uh, an understanding of nature that might be different from the classical forester. And so that's why you have this uh, battle of interests and these yeah. different policies, and it's about the arguments uh, that you bring. But the forest sector is not very happy with what is happening now in the, at the European Union level because it's seen as one-sided and too much neglecting uh, the other aspects that forests okay. uh, provide when it comes to providing a resource for sustainable uh, development. It, it, it's focusing too much on protecting forests and that that is the issue at the moment uh, Brian as an outsider uh, who is uh, married with a Polish woman uh, uh, what's your perception of the EU how is it working Europe 
I, I, I can't comment. I don't you, know enough. You, you don't no. dare to. No, but we can continue with the uh, challenges in North America. <laughs> okay. Yeah. okay, he's, he's also a, a lawyer. Uh, Good. That's always the, nice if you want to have a discussion. Oh, I don't want to say anything because it's, this, is too, this topic is too hot for me. Now. And my <laughs> wife will kill me. <laughs> Ex-wife. <laughs> Ex. 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 Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, it was after so the first attempt. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so we can talk about uh, maybe United States policy a little bit and uh, yeah. the federal forest. So this is the national forest system uh, where it's been unmanaged for quite a few generations now that um, we having issues with the forest being overstocked. We keep putting the fires out and now we have those large catastrophic wildfires that you hear about from time to time. And the real issue is we should be in there managing those forests and spending money on thinning them and reducing that, that fuel load that's in there since they haven't been harvesting in those federal forests. So this is uh, something that the president, Joe Biden, just signed an executive order about a month and a half ago, allocating $50 billion to this program, this project, so that to really make those uh, forests more resilient to the climate change with particular interest on uh, those large catastrophic wildfires. So less trees, less flammable. Yes, less understory, so the, the fires don't become big. They can burn in the understory the way it used to be, right? When, when nature was around, those forests burned over time, but then we had a policy to put out the fires. And then recently okay. there's been this uh, lack of harvesting in those federal forests because of litigation from interest groups that are uh, anytime the, the federal uh, government wants to do some management, there's a challenge from uh, an entity of some kind um, through the legal system. So, it, of course, it's lawsuit happy in the United States. So it's, it's again a sort of copying. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I just want to say we see that kind of lawfare now against uh, private forest owners mm. as well uh, from NGOs. Uh, so there is actually, uh, even though they win in the end, the, the usually the former foresters, most of them they don't endure a couple of years through the legal system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I want to open mm -hmm. discuss uh, the discussion uh, for a Q and A session. Um, we already had some questions. Oi, Uwe Sayer again. I can't stop myself. That's good. It's good. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you for, for this discussion, and I, the more I listen, the more I like the headline, um, the question of ownership. Um, what I heard this morning from you, Anna and Brian, is that you say forests, private forests are managed better, and you translated it already into more production, more productivity. Yeah. I think it's appropriate and okay. I translate it in a timber-based productivity, a cash timber-based productivity in the world we are living in. I have strong worries that I can understand that that you that you kind of are worried about the objections of state regulations that you are worried about NGO complaints to protect forests and to, to go in the other direction less based on economic timber based productivity but what I learned yesterday there's also the other aspect and also from Peter there's the other aspect of biodiversity of responsibility against climate change and all these kind of things I personally have doubts that the state regulations are fast enough to kind of act in a good way towards climate change and the new challenges. But I have even more concerns whether private ownership is keen enough and responsible enough to take over the responsibility of ownership rather than saying only, okay, we need to have productivity and cash, economic welfare, fair enough for a private owner. But do you have the responsibility for your private ownership beyond against the current challenges? That's my question. Okay, so you, you're suggesting that the private owner should be burdened with this extra responsibility to provide ecosystem services for free? No, 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 I'm more with you. I'm more with you. I'm, I'm very sympathizing with you saying, but I, I, I don't have the solution. My translation of ownership is responsibility as well as kind of having the advantages of ownership. Mm -hmm. What I heard yesterday from Susan is 
um, that she is hoping that there will come a, a commercial incentive for okay. for um, ecosystem service uh, ecosystem services like CO2 things that yeah. CO2 yeah. certificates. I worry that this is happening fast enough. I would like to do that. We FSC Germany work hard in that direction. But do you personally think that this is happening? I, I have a good idea. Wouldn't it be nice if every private owner gets some money for CO2 storage? Well, that's what we're talking about. And also for water quality and for air and for biodiversity. Yeah. All of those things get paid for that. Yeah, and I would also like to see what, what, what we heard yesterday about, I don't know the English word, Aboriginals people, uh, that they actually care for their property so that it would last for seven generations. And that's the thing with our uh, forest management. We don't thinking, it's not like a quick cash for us. It's uh, like, this is supposed to be sustainable and uh, work and uh, being everyone, uh, well, there are always crazy people everywhere, but most people think that they want to hand something better over to the next generation and the next generation over that. So I think it's, 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 it's a very, for me, uh, strange way of looking at the private forest owners, especially the family forest owners. There's a, a general and, and a specific answer. The general one is, as a, as, a, as a forest owner in the multifunctional world, you can have a portfolio of services that you provide and you try to enter the market. So you can protect your forest for biodiversity and, and, and see if there is funding available to do exactly that. Or you open a recreation facility in your forest and see if there is an entrance fee that you can charge and so on. So you do not necessarily have to produce timber, but uh, of course, in the m m many most cases, timber production is the most important economic uh, value that you that you have at the forest. But but of course, again, you can choose many many services, and that's the private side of the markets. And then there's the public side because we're talking about the CO2. And I mean, in Germany, there's there's this uh, debate, and al already there's that there, there's money from the public sector provided for some of the services that forests provide. And that that's the other side. How much public money do you want to spend on other services that forests should should provide? And and that's a very heated debate. That's not very easy. And CO2 is, is a discussion already, Andreas, which okay. is very, very okay. intense. I like because, to hear it. Because, no, no, because it has many aspects. And, okay. and, and ab about how long do you want to this grow trees and discussion. how much do you want to use them? Mm -hmm. Anna? Yeah, I, I think the Swedish uh, forest authorities used to work in a good way because science is really important when things are changing. And they used to work very close with the forest uh, owners. And they actually, they gave... Um, uh, what do I say? They gave a specific advice of how to do things, and they could choose to do things in a, in a various uh, in various ways. So, this transfer of of actually the latest updates of what you can do and what you perhaps shouldn't do that is really important. And it has not. It can be made in a way of advice of good management, and not always by. Uh, you have to do this uh, now and then because as in a country like we have a thir 330 private forest owners, there are, uh, well, very many ways and, and uh, minds on how to, uh, uh, to uh, ma manage the forest, which is a diversity in itself. Okay, I have a question, but now first, Ronald. Just I mean. want to follow up on the, the question which was before there or so, like, you know. From Uwe. From Uwe, exactly, yeah. you know, and I think, uh, Provocative question: Do we need a common forest policy like we have in agriculture for Europe, yeah, where we actually have a system like and a frame like for this all these uh, subsidies which is going into agriculture? Yeah, because agriculture also has a agricultural land has a very similar sort of uh, you know multiple functions like for society and for food mm -hmm. and for energy production. Yeah, uh, and uh, and I think that the discussion goes somewhere. Like you know, do we need a common forestry policy in the yeah. European Union to really make sure also like that all these demands, these increasing demands on forestry is actually somehow channeled and put into a frame yeah, where we can justify then also the subsidies which are going into the system. Yeah? Wow. Do we need? Yeah. Do we need it? <laughs> Depends who you ask. <laughs> 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 <I'm good. laughs> no, no, but no. But in general, I, th I think uh, th uh, policies have developed now for many years in other areas that already there is a decentralized forest policy de facto in the European Union because you have many legal aspects already that define many management uh, restrictions or ways of that you have to do for climate, for biodiversity and so on. So there is already a forest policy, but not a centralized one. 
there, in my opinion, there would have been a, a time many years ago where it would have made a lot of sense to have a centralized European policy. But of course, uh, that is not uh, the same how, how private forest owners looked at that issue because there was always uh, the... Um, they, they were afraid that it would turn out like an agriculture policy with all the subsidy systems and that is not what they wanted, but it would not have been the same. That would have been my argument, but uh, it would have made sense to have a, some sort of uh, anchor for all the forestry issues in that to be on the same level of discussion with other policies in EU, mm -hmm. at the EU level. Mm -hmm. I personally, yeah, well, oh. I'm going to add something for my friend Uva and Brian. Uh, and maybe, Brian, you can speak to this because I know you know it very well. There's incentives for private uh, forestry owners to have a forest management program. Can you discuss that just a little bit? Because I don't think people understand that about North America. So it's, it's not just North America. It's the United States uh, as a whole. The federal government has provided some cash incentives to private forest landowners, mostly the small landowners, to provide some of those extra services for things like wildlife and water quality. And that's uh, just good, good management, really. And they will do a cost share. So it's not a gift. It's if you do part of it, we'll pay you for the other part of it. And indeed, it does come with a, a written plan. And part of it has to have a sustainability um, metric attached to it, either through the Sustainable Forest Institute or FSC or something like that. So there is a connection back to the sustainability goals that's driving the landowners to be incentivized to provide some uh, of those um, services in return for a cost share from the federal government in the United States. Is this some, something we could learn from, from uh, North America, from the United States? Uh, the, the incentive system. I mean, that's what, what what's what's happening in 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 our uh, countries anyway, with, with with the legal basis and also the the policy instruments that 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 are around uh, connected to that law. You always have, uh, of course, a, a financial incentive system for planting certain tree species, for example, or for providing uh, a biodiversity. Uh, okay. So so there is already a very well developed system in most of the EU uh -huh. countries on that aspect. Okay, uh, there was a. a a question from Sweden. Yeah, the, the question is really, I have to explain a little bit first. When the European Union decided that fossil gas is a sustainable investment, yeah. but bioenergy from the forest is not, mm -hmm. the belief in the European Union really went down yeah. in Sweden. And the storage of carbon in forests, I think, is a really a high risk project mm -hmm. because climate change is already here. And the forests in Spain, Portugal, Italy, Greece, they burn, and they will burn more and more every year. The forests in Central Europe, they die from storm felling and insect damage, uh, also because of the climate change. So I actually say that, that many countries in Central Europe, like the Czech Republic, they have a less carbon in the forest now than they had five years ago because of insect damage. So actually, I think that the Austrian way of a sustainable use of, of forest products combined with a rather high standing volume is actually might be the best way to, to manage forests in Europe. Uh, and this belief that you actually can store loads of coal, it's against nature because nature wants to release the coal so that new organisms can use this again. So, so I, I really don't think this is a possible way. I would you, like you to have a if you uh, uh, if you Sorry, if you're talking about coal, you mean uh, biochar? Uh, coal, carbon dioxide is coal. It's, it's in yes, the circulation which, of natural coal. It's not comes from the earth, it comes from the trees. A actually, all coal comes yes, from the I air. I know, but it's not fossil. <laughs> no, it's not fossil. No, it's not fossil. Okay. You should use okay. the, circle of, the, the natural circle of coal. That is what, what we can use. The big challenge will be biodiversity. How much coal yeah, can yeah. we use without affecting I guess there are, in the scientific world, some other opinions about the charcoal. If you think of Terra Preta, in, uh, which the Indians, what the Indians are doing in, in the Amazonas region. If you look at the... What, from what if I've heard, it doesn't... No. But if you look at the Amazon region before the white man came, there they just discovered two huge cities in the Bolivian jungle. Mm. I think that the forests okay. in the Amazon were used quite a lot before the white man. We just 
don't know it. So it's just a, it's just a fake. No, I think we should end the discussion now because Austria is the best example. So thank you for that. And I think <laughs> time for a break. <laughs> 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 Yeah, no, no. No, but can I come back to that one point? And uh, and we did uh, a, a modeling also on on the CO2 and and the storage capacity of, yeah. of of Austrian forests in the next 150 years. And depending on the scenarios, but the, but also Austrian forests will turn to a source rather than being a sink, depending yeah. on climate change and the effects uh, on how much CO2 we have in the atmosphere. And that is what I meant. We should not have the illusion that forests will solve all the problems because very prominently, very often also in international agreements, it's always, yes, uh, and forests will store carbon and we will plant more trees. And uh, yes, that's, it's all very, it's nice to plant trees, no doubt about that, but it will not be the solution. So uh, we're in danger. Uh, maybe forests in future are a, a source already in, in Canada. They well, in, in British Columbia, where Susan was speaking from yesterday, that has now become a source, uh, an emitter of carbon dioxide oh. due to the insect outbreaks and the fires in the recent past. So, so over the, the recent past, it's gone from being a sink to a source of carbon dioxide. Okay. Luckily, Canada is a big country and there are other places that can absorb that difference. But... Um, on this, you make a very good point that it's yeah. very risky mm. to store carbon in trees out in the forest that are susceptible. So, so uh, I just want to. Oh, Tom, I have a, I have a. For you, I always question. have two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a little bit of a policy question, and also going back to the United States, how we have some federal programs, but we also have very strong state uh, forestry regulations and taxation so in certain uh like for example new york state has very uh strict rules on management policies whereas maine we have uh it's very much privatized and up to the individual foresters and each state kind of lives leaves each other alone but um as as we look at the european union How, how does that work with each country? And within each country, are you taxing the forest landowners? And is there an opportunity with this structure locally to incentivize the uh, forest landowners to uh, practice uh, certain things with incentives, property tax? Um, yeah, I have to say that... We Uh, not to answer the tax question, but but uh, the other policy question when it comes to EU, and it's combined with our uh, our legal national legal system. It is a problem, for instance, in Sweden, and all because we already have layers upon layers upon layers of legislation, and now we see so many different uh, initiatives in this area that are actually no one has the cap capacity to see uh, the effect on the actual private forest owner uh, uh, how how am i going to have a foreseeability uh, this it takes a uh, uh, hundred years for uh, a tree approximately to grow in sweden so what if i do this today what can i do in two years in three years no one can tell uh, a forester at this problem which is a huge problem and and as you said the trust in the eu when they make this kind of uh, uh, definition one thing is uh, uh, fossil gas and oil as sustainable and not uh, uh, bioenergy uh, is a huge problem and that's just one of the definition that that has gone wrong but we also see that uh, some of the uh, uh, initiatives from the eu they uh, held definitions that are not ready so this means that they may change, they may change quickly. And, and this lack of uh, foreseeability is, is against, you know, general principles of legal foreseeability, uh, legal, well, the property rights and the legal security. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Anna. Uh, um, we are running out of time, so I want to close, wind up this discussion with a last question for my panelists. Um, the question is simple. What would be your uh, thinking of uh, reforestation? What would be your call for action, Brian? 
if you start. Um, again, because we need reforestation. We need reforestation. Because of the wildfires. Yeah, and uh, and the and the increasing pressures from the climate change and insects and all these things. So I think having more uh, adaptable regulations would be good. So working in the assisted migration and, and uh, some of the innovative things that we can do. So I would say adjusting the regulations uh, to adapt okay. quicker so that we're not stuck in, in uh, regulations. Update the regulations. Peter? So I'll do a little promo at the end. Use our traffic light system. Come to me. I'll yes. tell you what to plant. <laughs> and so yeah. It's about the fitness for climate for the future and you have to take that into account and uh, factor in how will the future look and then you'll be good in what you reforest. Uh, do the right thing with, with the right laws and mm. yeah foreseeability uh, the right incentives and uh, research that you work closely together with the the farmer foresters to uh, in in a uh, what is it, in a free way then we don't that's what we used to have and it worked really well that has been proven uh, in our country ladies and gentlemen uh, a big round of applause for my panelists <laughs> We are having right, going right now into a, a short a coffee break and then at 11 starts the inspirational journey. You know we have uh, three stands outside. The, the first one is, I just want to tell you a little bit, it's about forest management and reforestation in the US. And you can talk to Scott McGuire and Tom Fox. Uh, the second one is Effect on Climate Change on Forest Management hosted by Stephen Hunziger, Stefan Hunziger. Um, he's from the Swiss Federal Institute for Forest, Snow and Landscape Research. Research. This guy knows a lot. And there's also one, uh, Nurseries, a Current State and Future Changes. Changes hosted by Tobias Fiebig from LICO. And uh, of course, you can have your special questions for head-to-head -to, -head to our panelists. They also will uh, be outside at the desk. Thank you very much and have a nice coffee break. Thank you.